Amen. We've been preaching verse by verse through the Bible, and we're in Matthew chapter 9, or chapter 12, rather, verse 9. Amen. And if you don't mind, pull me up a little bit on the, on the monitors so I can hear myself. Sometimes I don't make sense when I can't hear myself. And sometimes I don't make sense when I hear myself. And I know I don't make sense when I talk to myself. But anyway, we are in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. And um, last week, we talked about the Pharisees were following Jesus around to catch him breaking the Sabbath, and how finally Jesus rebuked them and just told them, hey, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And what a joy it is to know that we've got a God that doesn't put us under a bunch of rules and regulations that we can't keep. Doesn't matter whether we can keep them or not. The, th the big things and the things that God wants us to keep, he has planted in our hearts as born again Christians. The law has been written in our hearts as we serve God and give God glory. Let's stand for the reading of God's word, Matthew chapter nine, or chapter 12 rather, I keep going to chapter nine. I'll have to look at that later after service and see if there's a reason for that. Chapter 12, Matthew, verse 9. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it? And lift it out. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out, held counsel against Jesus, how they might destroy him. I want to use for a subject this morning, we have a strong Savior. You may be seated. We have a very, very strong Savior. And by the time I get through this morning, I want you to see a, an aggressive Christ, an aggressive gospel. I want you to see that God is aggressive about his love for you and I. That Jesus is aggressive about snatching people out of the fires of hell. That Jesus is not a weak, timid Savior. He's bold, he's powerful, he's wise, he's courageous, he's all powerful, and he can save to the uttermost them that are in the guttermost, he can save them to the uttermost by him that liveth forever and ever, our great high priest. So we, we have a strong Savior, and he's very strong, and we need to get a glimpse of this. Now, notice the Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus breaking the Sabbath. Well, it's kind of hard to break the Sabbath when you are the Sabbath. Hello. It's kind of hard to misspeak when you are the Word of God. And Jesus is the Word of God. Whatever he says, the Word of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. God's Word made flesh dwelling among us. And he is the Sabbath. So the Pharisees are trying to find fault with Jesus. Well, first of all, I haven't been looking for anything, but I've not found any fault with Jesus. I mean, in this room, not been looking for anything, but we've not found no fault with Jesus. Amen. A lot of folks can find fault with you and me, but they can't find fault with Jesus Christ. Amen. They can find fault in the church. They can find fault in politics. They can find fault in religion, but they cannot find fault in Jesus Christ unless you are an Ishmaelite. And if you are an Ishmaelite, you're on the other track, the other side of the track, and you are not the promised seed. You are simply the, the child of Hagar. And uh, we'll talk some about that n tonight, so I don't want to get sidetracked. But anyway, these Pharisees brought a man that was, had a withered hand. I assumed that his hand was not just withered, his whole arm was withered. But, and you say, how do you think that his whole arm was withered? Because Jesus Christ told him to stretch it out. Well, it's kind of hard to stretch out a hand. So his arm and his hand was withered. And um, so the Pharisees bring this man into the temple 
on the Sabbath, in the synagogue, on the Sabbath. And Jesus is there, and they bring this man to the front row, and they ask Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus groaned and kind of spit fire a little bit. He's a little irritated about it. He said, which one among you, if you have a sheep that falls into the pit, doesn't go down and raise it up out of the pit? Uh, uh, because your sheep has fallen into the pit, you go and lift it up, and every one of you would do the same. Isn't a man more important than an animal? Isn't a man more important than a sheep? He said, it is lawful. It is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. I love that, don't you? Then he says to the one with the withered hand, stretch forth thy hand. I giggled when I read this. Because the Pharisees brought him in. And the question is, when Jesus Christ said to the man with the withered hand, stretch forth thy hand, and he stretched it forth and he was healed, my question is, which way did he stretch his hand? Did he stretch it toward Jesus? Or did he stretch it toward the Pharisees? I think he did both. I think if we'll stretch our heart toward Jesus, he will heal us. We'll stretch our minds and our souls toward Jesus. He will save us. If we'll stretch forth, even in the impossible situation, if we'll stretch our lives toward Jesus, he will give us the power, the strength, and the unction to heal us. Then afterward, we can have the right hand to fellowship. And I believe that after Jesus healed this man, I don't have no Bible to prove it, but I kind of think it probably was pretty cool when Jesus Christ said, stretch forth your hand, and he did, and he was healed. I think he went around wanting stretching forth his hand going like this to all the Pharisees. I think he just went, went from one row to the other going. Amen? Now, Jesus wouldn't do that, but I would. Hello? Jesus wouldn't rub it in, but he would. And I mean, I like to rub it into the world that Jesus Christ has saved my soul. Now they get together, the Pharisees, and they decide they want to kill Jesus. Verse 14 says, the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him that they might destroy him. That's strong words. Destroy Jesus. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and, uh, and a great multitude followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken, spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, this is in Isaiah 42, verse 1 through 4, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. I want to say right here, according to these scriptures, Jesus was not a protester. He was not a rioter. He was not a violent protester. Things wasn't going his way, he didn't protest. In fact, Jesus didn't even deal with the crowds. He preached to the crowds. But when he preached to the crowds, he zoomed in on individuals' hearts. He zoomed in on individuals' minds and individuals' troubles' lives. And when Jesus Christ came, he came to zoom in on individuals, not crowds. He didn't come there to overturn Rome. He didn't come there to overturn the crowds that were going astray. He came there to speak to individuals that they can be happy. They can be forgiven of their sin. They can be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 through 4 says he would not strive. He wouldn't go out in the streets and cry and protest. I'm being unjustly treated. He didn't go out on the streets and say, ooh, the Pharisees are trying to kill me. I'm sad. He didn't go out and say, oh, man, everybody's down on me. I'm so troubled. And you, you didn't get him a picket sign and get up and protest 
the Pharisees. He just went about doing good, healing all them that were oppressed of the devil, according to Acts 10, 38. He just went about touching individuals' lives because Jesus is a personal savior. He's not a crowd savior. Now he'll save Israel in the future, not every individual in the nation, but he'll rescue the nation from God-haters and anti-Semitism. He will bring to pass his messiahship, his kingship, his lordship on earth in the future. Keep your eye on Israel. Hello, keep your eye on Israel. As I said earlier, not only does Israel need to be delivered from Hamas, but the Palestines need to be delivered from Hamas. Israel is a victim. Israel has been mistreated by many different nations all around. And the Palestine, Palestinians are held captive by wicked, ISIS, God-hating, well, misled, God-misled people that are vicious and wicked and wild and, and inhumane. And so one day, I believe that Jesus Christ will rid us of all Hamas, all violence, amen. You know, violence is kind of like weeds. You can pull them up all day long and they'll keep coming back. I got some spray for the weeds around here at the church. Josh did. We got some of that mean stuff. That, some of that stuff that JR uses. Some of that stuff that makes the fence rows look like the moon. And we got that old weed spray out and we begin to spray the fences and Josh really laid it on it. He baptized them. He didn't sprinkle them. He baptized the weeds in this liquid Hamas stuff. <laughs> they died. They're back. Now, I mean, you know, that's the story of humanity. The wicked die, but they always come back. Amen? So when I call you a young sprout, don't get too happy about that. All young sprouts turn out to be old weeds sometimes. <laughs> Amen? Come on, I'm preaching better than you responded. And Jesus was not a protester. He didn't go out and protest. He wasn't in a political movement. He wasn't trying to get his way because the Pharisees were trying to kill him. He told his, those that loved him and those that was with him, he charged them in verse 16 that they should not make him known. And he would be like Isaiah the prophet said in 42 verse 1 through 4, that he would be, he would not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. He would be so tender that a bruised reed he would not break. He'd, bo he'd be so kind that a smoking flax he would not quench out. If something was burning that needed to burn, he'd fan it, burn on. Something that was broken, he would be careful not to break it worse until he would sin. Fourth judgment, judgment against sin, judgment against evil unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Hallelujah. I'm one of them Gentiles. How many of you are one of them Gentiles? In him the Gentiles trust. I trust him because he is a strong Savior. Amen. So the Pharisees tried to get Jesus in the field among the the, the, the wheat and the barley or the corn crops, the crouch down to catch him. They bring someone into the synagogue trying to prove to Jesus he couldn't heal on the Sabbath, and Jesus corrects them and says, look, it is lawful. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. And so he says, he goes out. They're angry. They're going to kill him. They've made up their mind. The Pharisees made up their mind. They're going to destroy Jesus. And Jesus doesn't go out and pick it. He doesn't go out and protest. He just tells his disciples, just be quiet. Just hush. I've got this. Let me know Jesus has this. And he's not out breaking. He's not out uh, breaking bruised reeds. He's not out uh, um, taking a smoking uh, flax and shall he not quench. He's out there touching lives. So the Pharisee says, let's get him an impossible job. How many know that we're good at giving Jesus an impossible job? 
Jesus has an impossible job. I mean, no, that's, that's kind of a crazy statement because there's no such thing as an impossible job for Jesus. But they gave him what they thought was an impossible job for Jesus. So they brought to him one possessed with the devil. Now, I don't know whether the Pharisees brought him or someone else brought him, but they brought someone full of the devil. Not only was he full of the devil, he was blind and he couldn't talk. He was dumb. And Jesus healed him insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? And the Pharisees, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow did not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, the lord of the fly, and the Philistine god. Now, I want to just point something out that's very important. These Pharisees, or someone, brought to Jesus an impossible job. Now, I don't know whether the Pharisees brought him, but I guarantee the Pharisees saw a man that's blind, a man that can't talk. And they bring him to Jesus, and the Pharisees have this attitude. This will show him powerless. This will show Jesus unable. This this is something Jesus cannot do. Yahshua cannot do this. Because this man's blind. He can't even see the Messiah. He can't even see this one that claims to be the Messiah. He can't talk. And they in their day they thought a demon couldn't be cast out unless they could get his name. That's a bunch of nonsense. You say, well, didn't Jesus say to Legion, what is your name? And he said, I'm Legion. Well, first of all, if the devil's speaking, he's lying. And I'm sure that there was 2,000 or more demons in that man uh, on the gathering shore in the tombs. But nonetheless, Jesus asked, what is your name? Now, why did Jesus do that? He did that because he wanted to show them that there is more than one way to skin a demon. Hello. And so they're thinking, this man can't see, this man can't talk, so he can't tell Jesus his name. He can't tell Jesus what kind of demon he is. He can't tell Jesus, the demon can't tell Jesus his name. So thus, Jesus cannot do anything. How many know Jesus has been saving no-name people for a long time? Jesus has been saving nobodies for a long time. I are one. And by the grace of God, I'm a child of God, the blessing of God. In fact, you know, there's so many, there's so many dawns in our church on Sunday morning. They come in here. And, and as the dawns come in, I'm saying, this is the great dawning of that day. You know, it's the dawning of the day. There's so many Marys in this church, a Mary here, a Mary there, a Mary, Mary everywhere. There's Marys here, there, there's some Jameses here, there's some, uh, there's some JRs, that's a James. Uh, you know, there, there's different ones, Dale and Chris and, and Chris, Chris and Chris, and you know, the names go on. It doesn't matter whether you're James or Don or Mary or it doesn't matter if, you know, if your mom and dad called you a hudai. It doesn't matter if you're the son of Dodo. As I preach Wednesday night, the son of Dodo, Eliezer, son of Dodo. I heard Jerry say, that, spelled, that is pronounced doo Nothing wrong with having fun, amen? How many know, how many know Jesus can clean up doo-doo too? Amen. So there's hope for all of us. Hello. So Jesus breaks into this, this demon-possessed man, breaks into his house and delivers him from his darkness. He breaks into the dark room of his life And he delivers this demon-possessed man from his darkness. He breaks into his house and he turns the PA system up and loses his tongue to give God praise. 
Jesus Christ goes inside that person because we got a strong Savior. And he went inside and he kicked the devil out. He bound the strong man of the house and he set the captive free and he brought to pass a great deliverance from this blind man that was demon-possessed that could not talk. Woo! Man, I feel good. Someone ought to write a song about that. I feel good. Okay, let's, let's move on. That didn't go over too good. Verse 25 through 27. Jesus knew their thoughts because the Pharisees, let's, let's back up to verse 23. All the people were amazed what Jesus did. Is not this the son of David? They thought this is the Messiah. This is the son of David. But the Pharisees heard it and they said, this fellow did not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the Lord of the fly. Beelzebub, they were attributing, catching out the devil by the power of the devil. And Jesus said to them in verse 25, knowing their thoughts, he said, every kingdom divided against itself or is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Now, obviously, there were some disciples of the Pharisees that claimed that they were casting out demons. I don't know whether they were or not. I think the church is riddled with people saying they're casting out demons and they're just full of hot air. It takes a powerful Jesus to cast out a demon. It doesn't take a powerful you. It takes Jesus. Amen? Do you believe in casting out devils? Yeah. Uh, I've seen devils cast out on my part by accident. Demon just runs when the gospel is preached. Amen? Is there demon possession in the world today? Hello? Obviously. Is it as bad as it was in the days of when Jesus walked the earth? Probably it was probably hyped up during that time because Satan was in a, in a, he was in a, a, a quagmire. He was in a confusion. So there was probably more activity in that day because they, they were trying to stop Jesus. Now the devil just comes along, gives the church, here's you a sleeping pill. Here's you a sleeping pill. Here's you a sleeping pill. Oh, here's you a sleeping pill. Oh, let me give you a cherry lollipop. Suck on that a while. Let's, let's, let's have a watermelon feast. Let's get together and let's just have a, a, a good time. And let's, just, let's, just, and let's skip all that preaching stuff. No, no. This church is a Bible preaching church. Verse by verse through the scriptures, learning what God has to say. Am I against watermelon? No, bring me one. Am I against barbecue? Yes, I love barbecue. I'm not against it. Bring me, a, bring me the barbecue with lots of barbecue sauce and a wet towel to wipe my face because I'm going to have fun. Not against having fun. What I am against is not taking seriously the end time in which we live. And Jesus Christ, when they said to him, the Pharisees, you cast out devils by the spirit of the devil, Jesus Christ says pretty much, here's what Jesus Christ is pretty much saying. Satan is insane, but he's not crazy. Satan is insane, but he's not crazy. Notice what he says. Verse 25, he knows your thoughts. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How, should, how then his kingdom stands? How does his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. So he's basically saying, Satan is insane, but Satan's not crazy. Satan doesn't cast out Satan. Hello. Amen. And we need to understand that there's a process 
Satan is working on Satan's side. He's not working against himself. Amen? And we need to understand that, that Jesus Christ comes to bring a division between darkness and light. He comes to bring be, between death, death and life. Jesus comes to give us a choice. Abundant life, more abundantly, a life of blessing, a life of, of, of uh, grace and mercy, or a life of destruction. And the Pharisees said, well, Jesus, you're just casting out devils by the spirit of the devil. Notice, I want you to understand that this is so incredible. Jesus breaks, Jesus tells him how he did this. He tells him, Satan doesn't fight Satan. He said, if I, he said, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except the first blind, first, first he bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. He, he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Luke puts it this way in chapter 11. Same story. Luke says in chapter 11 verse 20. Through 22, Jesus Christ says, But if I by the finger of God cast out demons, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. Don't miss that phrase, upon you. It didn't say the kingdom of God has come to you. It says the kingdom of God is jumped upon you. Upon you. Amen? Now I want you to come to me and shake my hand, but I don't want you to come upon me. But how many know the kingdom of God wants to come upon you? And the Bible says the kingdom of God has come upon you when the strong man arm keepeth his palace, his, his, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he, everybody say stronger than the devil. We're talking about Jesus. Stronger than he is Jesus. Jesus, the strong man is the devil. The strong man is the binder, the devil binding people's lives, and the stronger than he is Jesus Christ. Then he shall come upon him, but when a stranger, but when a stranger, then he shall come upon him and overcome him. In other words, the stranger, the stronger comes upon him, that's the strong man, and overcomes him. He taketh from him all his armor within and he trust, that he trusts is in and divideth his spoil. Now, here's where we're going to get into some good preaching. Jesus Christ is an aggressive Savior. Get that out of your head that he's a timid, just kind of wandering the aisles of the church. No, he's got, he's, got a, he's got an army with him. He's got Holy Ghost with him. He's got the Word of God with him. He has a warfare with him. Jesus Christ is not a weak, timid Savior. And he is not afraid of the devil. And he is not afraid to do what is necessary to deliver your loved ones and friends. Don't stop praying for your lost loved ones. Don't stop praying for your lost grandchildren. Don't stop praying for the hopeless and it looks like there's no way that they're going to get out of it. Don't stop praying because Jesus breaks into the strong man's house. A stronger than the strong man. Jesus Christ breaks in to the house. That's what he did when he healed this blind man that couldn't talk, possessed of a devil. Jesus Christ broke into the strong man's house. He overcame the enemy and he loosed that man's eyes to see again and loosed his tongue to speak again. He set that man free because Jesus broke into his house. 
into that house where the strong man was, into that house where depression was, into that house where darkness was, into that house where pain and agony was, into that house where rejection was, into that house where sin and despair was, into that house where, where all the agonies and all the fears of, of life, into that house. He breaks into that house and he says, you gotta go. He says to the devil, you gotta go. Sickness, you gotta go. Demon, you gotta go. Blindness, you gotta go. Heartbreak, you gotta go. Depression, you gotta go. He breaks in and says, you have to go. He binds the devil and says, now run. Run to the light and your eyes see again. Run to the glory of God and praise God with your tongue again. You're loosed. That's a strong Savior. Amen. You see, you need to get it out of your head that Jesus Christ is just a weak, timid Savior. No, he's strong. Jesus can and will break into your house. Really? Jesus can and Jesus will break in to your house. And he will deal with what's troubling your mind. Jesus will break into your mind. He'll break into your heart. He'll break into your life. And he will give you a choice as to whether or not you want to make him Lord and let him sit on the throne of your heart. He'll give you that choice, but he'll break into your mind. He'll break into your heart. He'll break into your life. It's called conviction. It's called the Holy Ghost burning fire in someone's soul. It's called the wrath of God upon all ungodly. It's called the conviction of the Holy Ghost. He'll break into your house. You say, I don't believe that. Well, does the devil break into your mind? Does the devil try to break into your heart? Does the devil try to break into your life? Well, if the devil can break into your mind, if the devil can break into your heart, if the devil can break into your life, don't you doubt for a second that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the master of all human race, the master of all creation, and the Lord of all the angels, don't think for one second, don't think for one milli of a second that Jesus Christ cannot break into your mind and break into your heart and break into your soul and your life. Let me say real quickly, and you know, preachers never say anything real quickly, but let, let me say, some people are so bound. Some people are so messed up. Some people are so addicted. Some people are so down so riddled with unbelief. Some people are so riddled with past destruction, and past heartbreaks, and they're so bound by habits and so bound by unbelief and so bound by anger. They need Jesus to break into their house. You say, you don't have no Bible for that. I don't. Saul breathing out threatenings to the church of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter nine, he's headed to Damascus. He's going to persecute the church and God broke into Saul's life. Isn't that good? Not only did Jesus Christ break into Saul who became apostle Paul's life, but even on the day of Pentecost, Jesus broke in on the day of Pentecost. He breaks into one's house. Someone says, well, preacher, I, I think you're taking this too extreme. Uh, preacher, I just don't understand this. Well, some people are in such a mess, they require a break-in. Anybody know some folks that require a break-in? Some people are so held captive 
that the liberator must break into the house and bind the one holding that person captive. Some people are so bound in their own body, so bound, so locked up by unclean spirits, by vile things, that they need Jesus to break in. Don't give up on your sons or daughters that's gone astray. Don't give up on your neighbor and your friends that are so bad it looks like nothing can help them. Don't give up on your uh, dr dr drunkard loved one. Don't give up on your, your drug addicted loved one. Don't give up on that loved one that has a mind that's so scattered and so uh, insane and so uh, broken. Don't give up because we got a God. He's a strong Savior and he can break into their house. Hear me? Without permission. Well, I believe you've got to give God permission. That's a bunch of nonsense. God is God. God can do what he wants to do. Now, he can break in. He can break into your house. But it's up to you to make him Lord of all. It's up to you to say, yes, this is what I want. But you can't think clearly until Jesus is staring you in the face. Amen? I mean, I helped saw a great deal when Jesus was staring him right in the face. I helped a great deal. Amen? Now, some people use the argument, well, you know, Jesus, you know, you just, you just come forward and say, I do now let Jesus into my life. Nonsense. Well, I'm just going to go forward to church, shake the preacher's hand and say, I do now let Jesus into my life. Like you're giving God a favor. Hello. You don't find that in Revelation chapter 1. You find Jesus standing as glorified Lord of all, King of kings and Lord of lords, God Almighty risen from the dead, the holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. You see him saying, Come! Not a come like invitation, a come like commandment. And I mean, no, we need more, more commandments taking place from Jesus in people's lives. Amen? You said, well, preacher, how about Revelation 3.20? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door, I'll come in and we'll have supper. See, that makes it sound like he's a weak and he's not going to be aggressive. But you got to understand, he's not talking to a bunch of demon-possessed demon people in that church of Laodicea. He's talking to self-possessed people in that church of Laodicea. He's not talking to bound people in drugs and alcoholism. He's not talking to people that's bound by the devil. In fact, they're bound by themselves. They have no need of nothing. They think they have no need of money. They have no need because they have everything. They have no need of a Savior. They are self-possessed. And that's why Jesus Christ says, open the door, humble yourself, let me in. But I don't know too many people like that. But I know a whole lot of people, the devil's just using them for a, 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 a wiping mat. I know a lot of people that the devil's just using them and beating them up and destroying their lives and they feel like they're no good and they'll never amount to anything. They feel like they're separated from God and they'll never be able to, they feel like they can't come into church, the roof will fall in. They feel like they're unworthy to be in church. Let me tell you, friend, there's not anybody in this building worthy to be under the roof of God Almighty. God has given us that great blessing that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, we should give forth the praises of God and give God glory. Yeah. Woo! And so when Jesus Christ says, I broke in, stronger than the strong man breaks in. And I want you to know, I know some people that they need a break in. God needs to break into their mind. God needs to break into their heart. God needs to break into their past. 
God, God needs to break into their hopelessness. And when he breaks in, he'll bind the foolish thoughts of our heart. He'll bind that wicked shadows that Satan brings. And he'll loose you to the praises of God. Amen. And Jesus Christ says, if you're not with me, you're against me. Verse 29, or else how can one enter into the strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. I want you to understand something. I'd like to help you here. I want to help you with the misunderstanding of blaspheming the, the Holy Ghost. I want to help you with that for a minute. Can I help you with that? Let me would like to have some help with that. Oh, I feel like I've gone too far. I feel like I've sinned too much. I feel like I've done too wrong. I feel like I've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Let me explain the blas blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ gives some strong words about the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. He says to them Pharisees in verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all men of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Right there you need to stop, and we need to preach a while right there. Most people skip that first part of verse 31 and go straight to, but the blaspheming against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. See, we want to, we want to take that one last sentence of that verse and bring us into doubt and fear. But we need to take the bulk of that verse. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven of men. That's a shouting passage of Scripture. All, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be given him, forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Let's talk about the, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost just for a moment. And I'm not going to go into deep scriptural detail, but I want to share you some simple truths. Jesus Christ was standing before Pharisees. The fullness of the Godhead was in Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost was in Jesus without measure. And by the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ broke into the strong man's house. He set free the blind man that couldn't talk. He broke the powers of darkness, an impossible thing no one could do. And the Pharisee says, Jesus, you're full of the devil. Because what you're doing, you're doing by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. So what they were telling Jesus was, the Holy Ghost that's in you is of the devil. The Holy Ghost that's in you is the devil spirit. You're possessed with the devil. That's what triggered Jesus Christ to say, hey, you can be forgiven of any blasphemy, any sin, any manner of sin, any manner of blasphemy. You can be forgiven. You can sin against me, be forgiven. You can sin against the Father, be forgiven. But if you sin against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven in this world nor the world to come. So let's break this down for a moment. Who is Jesus talking to? The Pharisees. And why did Jesus say it? Because of what the Pharisees said. They attributed Jesus as being possessed by the devil. And in so many terms, they were telling Jesus, the spirit that's in you is a demonic spirit. They were calling the Holy Ghost a demon. That is blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. The Pharisees were doing that. But Jesus is not here right now. He's not, the fullness of the Godhead is not in Jesus right now, here geographically, in this location. 
The Holy Ghost is here, but Jesus' physical body is not here. And so we don't, we can't really blaspheme the Holy Ghost because Jesus is not here full of the Holy Ghost for us to attribute what Jesus does to a lost person by the power of the devil. So this blasphemy of the Holy Ghost very well could be the only place that it could be done was when Jesus walked the earth during that time period. The blasphemy of the Holy Ghost was only for that moment. It can't be done today. But for those of you who say, I don't believe that, okay, let's, let's, let's reason a little bit, okay? The Bible says that the, no man comes to, the G, comes to Jesus, the Son, except the Father draw him. Is that correct? And the Bible says that all them come to Jesus that Jesus will no wise cast out. The Bible says the Holy Ghost convicts us of our sin. The Bible says the Holy Ghost draws us to Christ. The Bible says the Holy Ghost seals us into the presence and God's promise of eternal life. So, the fact that you're sitting in this church tells me you've never blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Because people that have ever blasphemed the Holy Ghost are not churchgoers. You couldn't take them to church if you drug them behind a slow tractor with a big logging chain. Now, there's some people that won't come to church and they haven't blasphemed the Holy Ghost. But I'm trying to tell you, if a person has ever blasphemed the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will never convict you again to come to church convict you again to read your Bible. The Holy Ghost will never convict you again to come to Jesus. The Holy Ghost will never convict you, never draw you, never speak to you, never convict you of your sin. You will just have that hollow, demonic look in your eye sockets because God has literally wiped his hands clean of you. If you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, if you still want Jesus, good news, you haven't blasphemed the Holy Ghost. If you want Jesus in your life, you haven't blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You're here in this room. You haven't blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You want to read your Bible? You want to, believe me, if you want to listen to this preacher preach, you haven't blasphemed the Holy Ghost. The fact is, as long as the Spirit of God's tugging on your heart, you have a desire to know the truth, and you have a fear of God's coming judgment tells me that you've never blasphemed the Holy Ghost because the fear of God's coming judgment is given to us by the Holy Ghost. The drawing of the, to Christ is done by the Holy Ghost. The convicting of sin is done by the Holy Ghost. Are there some people out there that's blaspheming the Holy Ghost? I, I just want to tell you, uh, I give you two interpretations that I think are very strong, but let me give you a, a third thought. Could it be that if a person says no to the Holy Ghost over and over again, says, I'm not interested in your God. I'm not interested in repenting. I'm not interested in living, to God, living for God. If Jesus breaks into your house, binds a strong man, he speaks to you and you say, no, I'm not interested in you. I'm not interested in the Holy Ghost. I'm not interested in eternal life. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Leave me alone. In the end, you've committed a sin that can never be forgiven. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. I hope you got what I was trying to share today that's so important. Because some of you have children that are, get mad at me if you want to, but you're, some of you have children, they're devils. You think they're such a nice boy. No, they're not. They're going to hell. Some of you have grandchildren. You think they're the sweetest thing. No, they're little stinkweeds. They need to be saved. Hello? Say, so, well, I got my son, my cousin, my mom, my dad. Everybody's going to be born again. They're going to be saved. And it makes no difference what you think, how good they are. He's such a good boy. I think I heard somewhere, read somewhere, where Hitler's mama said, he's such a good boy. (laughs) 
I'll give you some good info here. You don't have to wait for God to speak to your loved one to be saved. You just have to pray that God will break in to his house. You need to believe in an aggressive Savior. You need to believe in a strong Savior that will break into your loved one's house and will bind the strong man because a stronger man than he is there. And then they can truthfully and rightfully with a clear mind, void of addiction, with a clear mind, void of drunkenness, with a clear mind, void of unbelief, the clear mind, they can decide for themselves. I want Jesus, or I don't. I'm afraid we've served too much fizz, fizz, soda pop in churches so long that we don't know the reality of this thing. We need God to cross this nation and break in. We need God to break in and bind the strong man. Amen? As I said earlier, you can be pro-Israel and not be anti-Palestinian. And the truth is, Israel needs deliverance from Hamas, ISIS, and others that would want to annihilate her. But the Palestinians, many of them are innocent. They need to be delivered as well. There's no easy solution. There is no easy solution. In fact, I think it was uh, Zechariah that Jerusalem would be a trembling cup to all nations. Jerusalem would be a trembling cup. How many would agree that cup's trembling right now? Jerusalem be a trembling cup. Israel, and I'll share this tonight, some of it, just a slight bigger than New Jersey. If you look at Israel on a map, you're going to see a little dot. And all the countries around it are either Palestinian, Hamas, Arab, descendants of Ishmael, Muslim, she hides, the list goes on. For years, since 1948, Israel became a nation. For years, they have shot missiles, bombs into Israel on a weekly basis. For years, they wanted the total annihilation of Israel. For years. They don't want Israel to exist. They want to destroy the Jews. I happen to know that Israel in the time of Reagan agreed, Israel agreed that Palestinians could have a state, but it was never carried out. Israel was willing to give up land in order to have peace. But the surrounding countries refused to give Israel any right to live. And they wanted Israel to be destroyed. Week after week, month after month, Israel has been attacked. War after war after war after war since 1948. Beginning a massive war the very year they were declared a nation. Good people all around Israel, yes, but bad people as well. And Israel has been that little bitty nation, just a tiny little spot and. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of land, miles of square, miles of land. And around them is 22 Arab states, 52 Muslim states, ISIS, Hamas, radical Islam, Lebanon, Iran, which is the old Persia. And little Israel's right there. Now you tell me who's bullying who. See, the world wants to make, media wants to say Israel's bullying the world. No, the world is bullying Israel. You tell me who's bullying who. Israel's not a bully. I can't say that everything she does is correct. In fact, she has gathered into the land, not as believers, but as unbelievers. 
I'm, I'm, I'm preaching my sermon. I've got to stop. We'll pick up tonight. But let me, let me ask you to change your prayer a little bit. I want to change your prayer a little bit about your loved ones. Here's what I'd like for you to be in to change your prayer a little bit. I need, to, I need you and I need to pr- start praying that Jesus is a strong Savior. That he is an aggressive Savior. And we need to start praying that God would break into our loved one's house. When I say house, I'm talking about their life. And we need to start praying that God will break into and bind the strong man that's holding our loved ones captive. And if we'll start praying that, we'll start getting hope. Hope is starting to come. I can tell by looking at some of you, hope's rising up in your, I can see it on your face. Wow, this is awesome. We're not waiting on Jesus to come along and gently convict people. We can believe Jesus just break into their life, just break in their house and, and, and break the strong man, bind the strong man. We can do it through intercessory prayer, yes, but why don't we just ask Jesus to go, don't bother to knock, just go in. Amen. Now I made a I made a deal with Jesus, and I mean when you make a deal with a Jew, you better watch you. But anyway, I made a deal with Jesus. But the deal with Jesus is my deal with Jesus. You never have to knock on my door ever again. You never have to knock on my door. The door's always open. And if you ever find it locked, break it down. If you find one room in my life that, and the door's locked, just break it in. Just break it down. Jesus, you never have to knock on my door again. You're welcome to break in any moment. You're welcome to break into my mind. You're welcome to break into my heart. You're welcome to break into my life. And if you find anything that's a wall, just tear it down and break in. Isn't that good? It's good stuff. Don't pat the cake. Give the Lord a big hand. (laughs) Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, I, I believe that we're approaching the end. I believe this is the beginning. And I think there may very well, it may very well be World War III coming. It may have already started. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not no easy solution. And I don't know how much trouble is on the, on, on the way, but I know trouble is. I don't know how much America will face. We'll talk about that tonight in the preaching, how much America will face. But I'm not sure. But one thing I'm sure of, that... God's blessing from Abraham, those that bless Israel, God will bless. They that bless Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, they that bless Israel, God will bless. They that curse Israel, God will curse. And the United States has been a blessing to Israel. Been a blessing to Israel. I will say that Harry Truman did not help Israel in her first war in 1948. He did not help her. He said, I'm, uh, we're busy doing other things. He did declare her state, but he did not support her in that war. But God did. God did. And she's still alive today, Israel. I think one of the blessings of Abraham to the church around the world One of the blessings to the church around the world, the blessing of Abraham to the church around the world, that is for justice, righteousness, and for Israel. Next great blessing, rapture of the church. Rapture of the church. What a blessing. What a blessing to be taken out of here before everything erupts with God's wrath and judgment. What a blessing. 
You say, I don't believe in the rapture. That's okay. You'll still go when it happens. You know Jesus. Don't worry about it. Don't sit stressed out. So preacher, you're wrong. I've been wrong before, but I'm awful happy about this wrong if it's wrong. God's coming after us. The ambassadors are going to be called home. That's what we are, ambassadors for Christ. When did it happen? I don't know. Maybe before the Magog War, maybe after, maybe during. I don't know. I don't know how bad it's going to get before we're gone. But I know one day we'll be gone. And we'll be with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Josh is going to come and bring a song. I hope you, I hope you got something out of today's message. And I really desired with all of my heart I mean, last Sunday we had a packed house. Sunday before we had a packed out. Three Sundays ago we had a packed out. And I was really hoping the house would be packed today to hear that we've got a powerful, strong Savior that can break into our loved one's house. And he can bind the strong one. And he can loose this bondage. This bondage of the God of prosperity, this bondage of blindness that's on people's lives, that this God can break in. Help you mentally, help you with your heart. Would you like to come here this morning, come to the altar and say, God, please break into my life. God, please break into my house. I need you. Would you do that? Altar's open.